Welcome back to CBS Mornings. This morning, we are hearing from the family of a black 16-year-old teenager who was shot after he went to the wrong door to pick up his young twin brothers in Kansas City. Ralph Yarrow's family says he went to the wrong address on Thursday night to pick up his little brothers. And after he rang the doorbell, he was shot once in the head and again after he fell to the ground. Ralph was released from the hospital this past Saturday, and he's been recovering at home. The man who allegedly shot him, 84-year-old Andrew Lester, has now just been charged. We're joined by Ralph Yarl's mother, that's Cleo Nagby, and the family's attorney, that is Lee Merritt. This is an interview that you'll see first on CBS Mornings. I, I don't know where to begin uh, to express how glad we are, Ms. Nagby, that your son is okay. It, it seems like a miracle and a blessing. Lee, it's good to see you as well. But I want to start with you, Ms. Nagby. Can you bring us up to date on how Ralph is doing under the circumstances and what his condition is at this time? Good morning and thanks for having me here. Ralph is doing uh, considerably well. Physically, mornings are hard, but his spirits are in a good place. I borrow from his spirits. He is in very good hands. Can you tell us, Ms. Nagby, the extent of his injuries, where he was shot, and what, the, what, what exactly happened to him that night in terms of his injuries? Ralph was shot on top of his left eye, that I would say in the left frontal lobe, and then he was shot again in the upper right arm. He was shot, he had the bullet in the, in the up here for about, let's say, up to 12 hours before it was taken out. So mm. that injury is extensive and it's the residual effect of that injury is going to stay with him for quite a while. He's home, but I want to remind everybody that Ralph is home because he's surrounded by a team of medical professionals. I'm mm. a nurse for almost 20 years. His aunt is a physical therapy. His uncle is a medical professional. That's why he's home. So mm. let's put that into perspective. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. What did the doctors tell you about how he was able to survive this injury? I couldn't believe it when we heard on the news that he was home and walking and talking. So yesterday I talked to his pediatrician and she said, so, the CT said that there is just minimal uh, 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 fragments of the bullet in his brain. And I said, yes. And she's like, how? And I said, I don't know how. And she's like, bless God. And that's yeah, all I could say, God. because if she doesn't yeah. understand how, I don't understand how, because if you get shot at that close of a range and the CT said that and the doctor don't mm -hmm. understand how, then I don't understand how. Yeah, so yeah, none of us understand how. Say. We're just all glad, Ms. Nackby, that he's alive. Lee, I'm going to get to you in just a second, but I want to know from his mother exactly what did your son tell you happened that night? So... His brothers were supposed to go for a sleepover because they didn't have school the next day. And in this day and age, as, his, as parents, we're quite leery of sleepovers. So we said, you guys can stay out with your friends, but you have to come home before 10 o'clock. So it was about 9.45. I'm like, Ralph, can you please pick up your brothers for me? Being the kiddies he is, he said, okay. But he's not the kid that travels with his phone, so he didn't take his phone. Yes. And mm -hmm. he was like, okay, I'm going to pick them up. And he didn't he mistake the street for the terrace. So he went, and it was 1100. That was the house address. And he went and rang the doorbell. And he was supposed to stay outside, and his brothers were supposed to run outside, get in the car, and they, and they come home. And that mm -hmm. was what was supposed to happen. And while he was standing there, his brothers didn't run outside, but he got a couple of bullets in his body instead of a couple of twins coming up out and giving him a hug. And that's mm. all I can say. I don't think I can mm -hmm. speak anymore. 
Yeah, side. yeah, I know. It, it, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult even to hear the details. Lee, you know, the man who has now been arrested, has now been charged. At first, there was no arrest in the case. He says that he feared for his life that night. What do you, what do you think when you hear that response? Well, it sounds awfully familiar. We know that blackness in and of itself, just being black, has been seen as a threat often in this country. And so when we hear him say, I fear it for my life, and we know that the only thing he was being confronted with was a 16-year-old ringing his doorbell, it is uh, obviously unjustifiable uh, for him to decide to use deadly force against this so-called threat. But again, blackness is not a threat. Yeah, you know, the prosecutor in the case said, uh, Lee, that there was a racial component to this case, but he didn't elaborate. Can you elaborate for us on what exactly that means in this particular case? Well, I'm, I'm interested in hearing what Prosecutor Zachary Thompson, who we will speak with later today, is referring to as the racial element. There's some obvious racial elements. It's a white shooter. It's a black boy. Uh, the white shooter perceives the black boy as a threat, and we hear that a lot, right? Uh, we saw the law enforcement community respond by essentially criminalizing the boy and not criminalizing the shooter, the 80-year-old man who shot an unarmed kid. Uh, he went home and slept in his bed that night. That's kind of common in, in the United States in terms of the racial dynamic in our, our justice system. But I'm not sure what uh, Prosecutor Thompson was referring to exactly. Uh, the, the man in this case is 80, 84 years old. Does that mean anything to you? Does that say anything to you? Was age a factor here? Or do you think that this was strictly a well, case based on race and he, and he says he was afraid? Yeah. Well, we, we want to know more about Andrew Lester and his, his mindset. The fact that he's 84 years old will be a, a consideration in terms of what he thought leading into the moment. But I'll remind you that the former president and the current president of the United States is about that age as well. It's not an age that's sort of over the hill for everyone. Uh, and so he had an opportunity to make um, intentional decisions, and he decided to shoot a 16-year-old boy. Mm. Uh, Ms. Napke, I want to close with you about your son, because I've heard him described as a kind soul, quiet, friendly, well-mannered, super smart, and a musical genius. And that's not his mother talking. These are people that know him as friends. What can you tell us about him? What kind of child is he? What kind of teenager is he? Ralph is a teenager. All teenagers are teenagers. They will... No teenager is a perfect teenager, but I'll tell you what Ralph and I will argue about. Ralph and I will argue about, Ralph, can you put the sheet music down and do your English homework? <laughs> Mom, I don't want to do Eng my English homework because it's boring. That's what, that's what we argue about. Oh, English that, is the only class that he does in school that's not a college-level class, so it's boring for him. Yeah, that's and what I we'll heard. Argue about. Well, that's a pretty good argument. I'll take that. And I, I heard that Yale has asked him, had asked him to apply to their school. I, th I think that Tw says something about twice. the caliber of kid. Okay, not once, but twice. <laughs> Let's get it straight, Ms. Nagby. Thank you. I understand that President Biden called your home yesterday. What did he say to you all? He said that he and Ralph joked that his dad was a clarinet player. And his dad told him that if it depended on President Biden to support the family on his musical skills, the family was going to die hungry. And Ralph <laughs> told him that he had jokes. Oh, it's nice to hear that he's still got a sense of humor. Lee, what's the next step in this case? What happens now? Well as I mentioned before, we'll, we'll be meeting with Prosecutor Thompson later today. Uh, we want to understand the charges that he did move forward with. We're happy that there are two felony charges that bear serious consequences, but we're, we're not quite sure why attempted murder wasn't one of the charges, and we want to explore that a little further. We're looking forward to speaking with federal prosecutors and investigators to see if this family's civil rights, uh, civil rights were violated, particularly in terms of due process. We expect yeah. all families who are met with this kind of trauma to get an immediate police response and a vigorous prosecution. That's not what this family was given before there was national outcry. Well, there's still a lot of questions here. And again, I'm going to close with the way we started. We are so excited and so happy and so relieved to know that your son has survived. Yes.
Thank, thank you so much. So often these stories don't end this way. And I'm very, very happy for your family no. today. No. Thank no. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. We'll be, thank we'll you. be right back. Thank, thank you, you, Sister Gill. Thank you.